Hello, I'm Chris Brown and welcome to episode 34 of Radicals in Conversation, the monthly podcast from Pluto Press, one of the world's leading independent radical publishers. A global pandemic, the onset of a massive economic crisis and the reinvigoration of a powerful social movement for racial justice. These are just some of the seismic events that have defined 2020, a year that still has several months left to run and yet already has few historical parallels. To give listeners some context, this month's episode was recorded in mid-June, at the height of the Black Lives Matter uprisings. We kept it on ice for a couple of months for scheduling reasons, partly in anticipation of a launch of a new series at the end of July, Vagabonds, Radical Pamphlets to Fan the Flames of Discontent. Well, we're joined on our panel today by two people who have been instrumental in the creation of Vagabonds and whose books speak to all the aforementioned questions of healthcare, racial injustice and capitalism in crisis. Max Haven, Research Chair in Culture, Media and Social Justice at Lakehead University in Canada and Director of the Reimagining Value Action Lab or Rival. Max is the series editor for Vagabonds, and his most recent book is Revenge Capitalism, The Ghosts of Empire, The Demons of Capital, and The Settling of Unpayable Debts, which was published by Pluto in May 2020. And we're also joined by Cassie Thornton, an artist and activist from the US, currently living in Canada. She's the author of The Hologram, one of the first new books in the Vagabond series. Cassie is also the co-director of Rival. As ever, we're offering podcast listeners an exclusive 50% off on the new Vagabonds books and Revenge Capitalism as well. Just go to plutobooks.com forward slash podcast reading for more details and use the coupon code podcast at the checkout. And lastly, before we get underway, it's time to shout out our thanks to the next group of Pluto's Patreon patrons, whose continued support and solidarity with our publishing project is very much appreciated. David Renton, Pauline van Moerich Broekman, Julian Lepertre, Francesca Aurelian, Emma Hacking, Catherine McKinnon, Alison O'Brien, Andrew Bevan, Andreas Skold, Amber G. H., David White, David Reed, Susan Lansdell, Komiku Shimitsu, Stefan, Christine Southwood, Ryan Bestford, Kathleen Bakewell, Thomas, Stephen Hulbert, Molly Drummond, Wael Hasim, Peter Herdman Grant, Shexi Zhang, R. Ravi Shankar, Shun Li, Richard Hull, Bobby G. W., Thomas Forrestal, Lawrence Cox, Andrew Perry, Lauren Percy Vicentic, Julia, Dom Davies, Holly Padfield Payne, Fabian Spretz Kraus, Jane Cooper, Sarah Humphreys, Thomas Pemberton, Edward Pickthall, Jadine, Sue Ferguson, Gabriel Carlyle, Del Lamanta, Neil, Benedict Buechel, Graham Smith, and Joanna Perron. So a big thanks to all of you for your continued support and solidarity. And if you're at home listening and you're not already a member, then do check it out. The link is patreon.com forward slash Pluto Press. Membership begins at £3 per month and benefits include free ebooks, discounts on our website across both print and ebooks, access to exclusive online content, including the unabridged version of this podcast, screen printed merchandise, and much more besides. So, without any further ado, here are Max Haven and Cassie Thornton. So, Cassie, Max, thanks to you both very much for coming on the show. Uh, it's really lovely to have you. And I'm looking forward to talking about both the new Vagabond series that you're both involved in, as well as more generally just kind of what's going on in the world today. So I think I'm right in saying that although you're back in Thunder Bay in Canada now, you were actually over here in London for much of the duration of the recent lockdown. So I guess what brought you here over to the UK in the first place? And did you actually get to do any of the things that you'd intended to while you were here? Uh, Yeah, I mean... In a way, we really got to do what we intended to do and and then in some ways not. But we originally decided to go to London because I had a residency at Further Field, which is a gallery Mm. and a kind of network of people in Finsbury Park. And it's like the oldest artist run center in the UK. Um, And so I had this residency planned for a couple of years where I was meant to work on this project, The Hologram. 
also the, the title of the book that's come out from the Vagabond series. And um, we had planned for so long to kind of work on doing research and developing the hologram, which was meant to be a feminist peer-to-peer -peer health project. And we arrived on March 2nd and had one in-person workshop on, I think, March 10th, where mm. we talked about the hologram, but we also did like physical exercises where we like breathed all over each other and touched each other um, <laughs> <laughs> and like hugged each other goodbye and stuff. And then with the week directly after that workshop, we kind of realized the intensity of coronavirus in the UK and in London specifically, and then lockdown happened. And so everything else from for the hologram went online. And Max also had a project that he had come to London to do, which kind of got thwarted. Mm, yeah, I was working on a project, and I still am, on the uh, epidemic of student anxiety mm. and the way that that's connected to capitalism and particularly a form of capitalism based on debt and financialization. So that project actually has, has manifested now as a podcast, and mm. we'll be back with that project once the lockdown closes to, to follow up on those themes. What's the name of the podcast, Out of Interest? Uh, the Order of Unmanageable Risks. How many episodes have you done of that so far? Uh, there are so far four episodes. We just recorded our fifth today. Um, and they range on a variety of topics. We interviewed uh, James Bridal uh, about his book, New Dark Age. Um, Esther Leslie, who's a professor at Brookbeck, about emojis and digital communication. Uh, Alana Lenton, who's a critical race scholar from Australia about uh, racism and anxiety. Harry Sewell, who's a, a community educator and uh, administrator in health and social care about racism and mental health. And then just today, we concluded an interview with the anthropologist Arjun Apadurai. Sounds great. Um, so what was your experience of lockdown here in London like? Does anything stand out as particularly noteworthy, either because it was inspiring or because it was awful or just, you know? We took a lot of really long walks, mm -hmm. um, especially in the early part of the lockdown when I feel like people were really, really following the rules. Uh, there was no one in the centre of London. And so during the day and into the night, we took really long walks and kind of got to experience things that we would never normally experience, like the sort of financial centre. I mean, I guess the financial centre is often did on the weekends and the nights, True. but yeah. an extra level of like desolation. And um, we walked on, I think, on Easter around St. Paul's Cathedral and sort of a once in a lifetime opportunity to just experience the city totally dead and empty. Mm -hmm. I was very taken with, with learning as much as I could about the sort of radical history of London, including through uh, Pluto books like uh, Rebel Footprints, which oh, is yeah, a great, great, great set of uh, tours of London. So I, I took some of those walks and also tried to link some of that radical history of London to the book that I published with Pluto in May, uh, Revenge mm. Capitalism, and thinking about the presence of capitalism in the moments when it's taken revenge on people and also when people have avenged themselves against capitalism. Well, we'll definitely talk a little bit about that book, I hope, in, in a sec. But before we do, uh, yeah, so Vagabonds, quite a lot of people maybe don't know about it yet because it's brand new um, but it's a series of radical pamphlets that's being produced through a collaboration between Pluto and Rival the reimagining value action lab uh, so before we move on to talking about uh, vagabonds itself perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about what Rival is and the work that you do there yeah sure the Rival stands for the reimagining value action lab uh, which Cassie and I co-direct here in Thunder Bay in Canada which is a small city on the northern shore of Lake Superior, where uh, I teach at Lakehead University, which is what houses Rival. Uh, it's a workshop for the radical imagination, social justice, and decolonization. Uh, and we work at the intersections of academic inquiry, activist uh, agitation, and artistic intervention. So it's mm -hmm. a platform for us to engage with many different sorts of colleagues and comrades, around creating spaces and vehicles to radically reimagine what might be possible. When we're in Thunder Bay, we organize a lot of events and workshops that relate specifically what's happening to what's happening in Thunder Bay. And it's quite interesting and loaded because 
uh, Thunder Bay has been found to be the sort of racism and murder capital of Canada. And the racism mm -hmm. that's experienced here is against mostly Indigenous people, but all people of color. And so we host loads of like workshops. Uh, we have a regular reading group. We've been doing sort of like some workshops for a couple of years that are more abolitionist, like reimagining the police, and then other workshops that are more about kind of recognizing and working out what is racism, where is it, and how do we kind of work with it and against it in a city that's really become recognized to be a sort of racist place with racist police. So it's been a super interesting thing to kind of do, we to kind of react and respond to what's happening here, which is always a kind of magnification of what's happening everywhere. And then we do a bunch of other, you know, we, I, I guess we also now have like a kind of uh, mini publishing studio inside of our studio. So we're doing a lot of work here with people kind of trying to figure out how to support the activist movements that want to be born here and uh, mm. help them kind of like do mini publishing projects and do like, you know, art and activism workshops to kind of support what's beginning to become normal here, which is resistance. And then uh, beyond our local activities, we also do things uh, in other cities and other places. So organizing conferences, organizing workshops, organizing publishing series, working with artists. Uh, we recently launched an accelerator program where we take uh, applications and then work with a select few groups from anywhere in the world to help them bring a kind of impossible project for the radical imagination into fruition. So... Yes, <laughs> it's a platform yeah. for us to do a lot of different things. I, I actually kind of wrote that one down, the impossible projects of the radical imagination. I thought that was quite nice. Um, yeah, so Max, uh, as you've already sort of mentioned, in addition to being, I guess, general editor of the new series, Vagabonds, you're also a Pluto author. So your most recent book, Revenge Capitalism, was published in May, full title being Revenge Capitalism, The Ghosts of Empire, Demons of Capital, and The Settling of Unpayable Debts. I really love the title. I think it's sort of very evocative. And I think the books struck a chord with a lot of people in the current moment as well. I was wondering if you could maybe just tell us a little bit more about some of the central ideas in that book. So particularly this idea of revenge in the context of, you know, the revenge capitalism uh, of the title. And then maybe, you know, how that connects up with what we're seeing at the moment in terms of these uprisings in the US and around the world and uh, in the context of COVID-19 as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, it's strange to have published a book on this topic at a moment when I think the themes that it speaks to are becoming so radically apparent. Uh, I mean, mm. uh, the revenge of capitalism has been apparent to many people for a long time. And I think especially the way that revenge works through the logics of racism and colonialism has been blatantly obvious to those who sort of suffer under them. But uh, my attempt in the book was to really name revenge as a kind of tendency within capitalist accumulation. And I wanted, it, it follows on my work on financialization, uh, where I was trying to understand the way that capitalism can be incredibly destructive and hurtling towards a certain kind of abyss, ecologically speaking, in terms of its humanitarian impacts, without any individual necessarily intending or wanting it. And so I speak mm -hmm. about the revenge of capitalism in, in this book as not the motivation of capitalism, because, of course, capitalism is a system. It's not a person. So it can't necessarily have a motivation in the same way that a human could. But the outcome of capitalism, that if we were to zoom out far enough from the surface of the earth and look at the planet as if from space and ask what is capitalism doing, we would likely not be opposed to the description that it is taking a certain kind of needless, warrantless revenge on people. And within that kind of bigger picture of revenge, uh, the way that capitalism takes revenge on people, there are then those forms of revenge that exist within capitalism and sustain capitalism. So this might look like the way that the ruling class has taken a kind of vengeance on uprisings of the working classes or the way in which militarized, weaponized, and white supremacist police forces take a kind of needless, warrantless revenge on black people, or the way in which colonialism, from a certain perspective, looks like just a whole story of needless, warrantless revenge in order to perpetuate the extraction of resources and the subjugation of workforces. And then the final kind of piece of the, of the puzzle is that then what happens is capitalism itself shapes 
what we think of as revenge. So revenge, it's true that across all of different human civilizations, revenge plays a part. It's a, it's something that we've never been without, and it's reflected in many of the greatest works of literature and philosophy and religion. And yet in any historical epoch, in any society, the powers that be will seek to define revenge. And they seek to define revenge in a specific way that masks the kind of revenge that the powerful are always taking to perpetuate their power, and then frames those who resist that power as needlessly pathologically and bestially vengeful. And so I go through a number of examples in the book of moments when the working classes, when colonized people, when racialized people have been labeled or slandered as sort of monstrously vengeful when they've sought to rise up against their oppression. We're recording this, I should say, to the listeners um, in early June, so it's the 8th of June today. Um, yesterday, they they pulled down a statue of a slave owner in Bristol, yes. which is a city, you know, founded on the slave trade, essentially, and enriched by the slave trade. And uh, the, the kind of the outcry in the mainstream against the people that have done this is it's kind of baffling when you think about what it represents and what the kind of the moral position of defending the existence of this statue requires. Um, what you've just said just kind of reminded me of this fact, I think. Quite, quite. Uh, C.L.R. James, the great uh, Caribbean philosopher, um, you know, made this point very clear that that slavery, and he was thinking specifically about Haiti, that slavery was a system of organized vengeance by white slave owners uh, and those white people whom they employed against enslaved black people. And the, in a way, the, the perpetuation of the legacies of slavery through the maintenance of that statue for centuries uh, is its own kind of racist revenge as well. And yet only when the protesters finally take the initiative and take down the statue, only at that moment does the discourse of revenge enter into the mainstream discourse, as, as if to say that these protesters are motivated by nothing more than a kind of nihilistic rage. And this is really what I'm trying to get at in the book, that, that there is a masking of the underlying revenge that is embodied in that statue, which then that invisibilization occurs through the displacement of revenge onto the protesting and onto specifically racialized protesters who are imagined in the kind of dominant white imaginary to be incapable of anything more than vengeful feeling. Mm, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you kind of touched on it already, uh, I suppose, but thinking about sort of policing again in the context of what you kind of write about in the book, because at the, at the end of Revenge Capitalism, you have this sort of uh, postscript, I suppose, which you would have been writing, I guess, at kind of the outset of COVID-19. And there's a bit in there which stood out again for me as feeling you know, quite prescient in the current moment, where you say, uh, it's likely that the chaos and deaths of the pandemic will be blamed on too much democracy, liberalism and empathy. Now that states are flexing their muscles and taking full command of society, there will be many who do not want the sleeve to be rolled back down. We may yet see in this crisis the use of repressive force on civilians, as it's already being used on migrants and incarcerated people. And, you know, it continues. But it just feels like the present moment kind of falls into this paradigm, perhaps as well. And I'm wondering, you know, how much do you think the context of lockdown and the pandemic has had a bearing on um, the events that we've witnessed over the last couple of weeks since the killing of George Floyd? I think the the two are, are intimately, intimately connected. And I think there's a there's a bad interpretation of the connection, which is the one that's sort of being grumbled about in the media, which is to suggest that, oh, people are only having this uprising because they've been cooped up inside too long and there's all of these misplaced frustrations which now make themselves expressed in protest. And that, I think, is just the latest in a long string of slanders and castigations of protests as misguided uh, unto a point where they're just explained away as vengeful. I think the, the much more important explanation is that what the pandemic revealed for all to see was how deeply uh, haunted our society is by the legacies of colonialism, racism, and by the structures of capitalism that devalue everyone's lives, but devalue our lives at different rates and with different consequences. So, you know, during the pandemic, it was becoming abundantly clear just before the murder in Minneapolis of just how drastic the toll of the virus was 
on non-white people in the UK, in the United States, here in Canada and elsewhere, and how yeah. dramatic that toll would be as the virus makes its way around the world. And I think it led to a widespread realization that we are living and we are being forced to help reproduce a system of capitalism that is a death machine. And that, I mean, in my framing, is taking this unnecessary, unwarranted and ultimately nihilistic revenge on the very people who give it life, which is to say humanity. And I think that there is a sense that these protests, though rightly, they're very much focused right now on the value of black life and the anti-black police violence. Underneath them, there is a demand for a different way of valuing life, a different way of understanding our shared common humanity and organizing society beyond endless repression in the name of accumulation. Just lastly, kind of on capitalism in the present moment, this vengeful kind of capitalism, how do you see the capitalist class responding to the crisis in the sense of if it were left entirely to the the elites, uh, the rich and the powerful, like what shape would a post-pandemic society and economy likely take? I think it's a complex question because w- one of the reasons why why movements are so successful right now is there are multiple splits between elites, both elites in different nation states, elites in different regions, and elites within specific nation states and regions. So I think there's one side of the capitalist class, uh, which I think today is mostly represented by corporations um, that are beholden to shareholders. One side of the capitalist class is trying to like woke wash the entire thing. You know, in the last few days, we've seen a barrage of very cynical statements from corporations declaring their uh, newfound uh, commitment to black life and their skepticism towards police repression really as a, as a marketing scheme or a scheme in order to placate their own workers who are increasingly uh, losing faith in corporations that they work for, that they have anything more than a profit at heart. And that that loss of faith can't come soon enough, of course. So I think on one hand, we have capitalist firms and corporations in the capitalist class seeking to somehow co-opt or ride the momentum of this, uh, these uprisings. On the other hand, we have a whole range of capitalist firms which are seeking to thrive on the disruption that the pandemic and the uprisings are creating. And I think the the culprit number one here are the major tech firms who are echoing and agreeing with statements and ideas that the nation state has finally failed and the pandemic proves this and suggesting that better data harvesting, data management and predictive analytics can provide essentially a replacement for the nation state in various ways. And this sometimes masquerades itself in very appealing uh, promises, like, for instance, basic guaranteed income or, you know, new metrics that are going to help us avoid further pandemics. But really what is underneath that is a sort of a new corporate order now empowered and uh, accelerated by artificial intelligence. And then I think underneath that, what is getting less press is that there are still a huge number of members of the capitalist and corporate class who only put away their Nazi uniforms because it was unappealing to wear them for a while, but have always been authoritarians. And I think we know in the United States especially, but also in the UK, there's a large number of people who've been extremely enriched by the last 30 years of neoliberalism who have plowed that money into supporting reactionary politicians who've pushed that money into uh, hacking into the democratic system as best they can in order to push uh, authoritarian politics and to fund authoritarian tendencies. And I think that they don't necessarily write op-eds in the New York Times or The Guardian, but these capitalists are definitely a force to be reckoned with, and they're very organized and very dangerous. Mm. Well, speaking of uh, organized and dangerous, then perhaps we should move on to talking a bit about Vagabonds itself, which is a new series of short books, you know, billed as radical pamphlets to fan the flames of discontent. Um, so perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about the the aims that you, you have for the series and the sort of principles or values that are sort of underpinning all of this. Yeah, absolutely. The project of Vagabonds begins with a conundrum, which is that today there's more text than ever 
and fewer readers than ever, which is to say that like we are barraged by text on our phones, on our computers, you know, and I think the the pandemic and the uprisings of early 2020 have just revealed this even more. Um, and at the same time, it feels like there's less and less attention out there for a kind of serious reading of radical ideas. And so Vagabonds attempts to think through, well, how would we create a new series of pamphlets or short books to meet this need? And how can we make the radical ideas matter in in a new way that, that takes full advantage of the possibilities of new technology, but also doesn't give up the long legacy of the radical book and of the pamphlet itself. So Vagabonds emerged from that kind of conundrum, also the conundrum of wanting a space where art, activism, and what is today colonized by academic inquiry, that but colonized by academe, uh, can, can come together for texts that are, as we put it, uh, radical, rigorous, and resonant. Radical in the sense that they fundamentally challenge power in our society, rigorous in the sense that they are in dialogue with other ideas and are being held to a high account for being coherent and meaningful, and resonant in the sense that these texts can't just be for a small elite who can read this type of book. They should they should ideally at least be accessible to a wider public and capable of really generating ideas that are going to be debated not only in universities, but well beyond that as well. Mm, yeah, no, it's it's really exciting. Just on a purely aesthetic note, I love the way they look as well. Definitely the strangest format book that we've uh, published here at Pluto. But um, no, they're, they look—they're sort of tall and thin, right? Yeah, it came from uh, looking at um, like books at a zine fair, right? Like the mm-hmm. Anarchist Book Fair in yeah. Toronto. I think, yeah, um, yeah, we lifted it, <laughs> <laughs> and it was also partly. Um, uh, when we were developing the concept for Vagabonds, um, Cassie had the idea of that it, somehow the original design, at least, should be should look as if it's made out of stolen materials, materials stolen from the university, um, which is to take up an idea from uh, Fred Moten and Stefano Harney of the Undercommons. And so originally it was the idea of, you know, the, the A4 or eight and a half by 11 piece of paper folded over on its tall axis and then wrapped in a file folder. So as if, as if these materials were literally being printed on the back or on recycled materials or stolen materials. Uh, and of course, we can't quite do that with Pluto, but the, the design, I think, is carried through in a really wonderful way. Mm. No, I love that. Well, I'm hoping we're going to have a good chunk of time to talk about Cassie's book, which is obviously one of the two coming out with the series. But perhaps uh, we can just quickly talk about Pandemonium, the proliferating borders of capital and the pandemic swerve, which is Angela Mitropoulos's book, which is one of the first of the two coming out. She's not here to speak about it because I think it's about 1.30 in the morning uh, for her. She's based over in Sydney. Um, but perhaps Max or Cassie, in her absence, could one of you Tell us a little bit about this project. I think Max. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's a fascinating book. Um, so for those not familiar with her work, uh, Metropolis is, I think, without exaggeration, really one of the finest and most interesting critical theorists of the last few years. Her book, Contract and Contagion, which came out in the mid-2000s, offered a really original and brilliant retheorization of capitalism and more than capitalism, sort of modern governmentality um, at the intersections of race, gender, and class with a specific focus on this notion of contagion and the the sort of fear or phobia of contagion that's at the core of the kind of patriarchal capitalist world order. Now, she traces this back to ancient Greece, but the general theme of her work in both Contract and Contagion and this new book, Pandemonium, is to suggest, if I, if I read it correctly, that the structures of power in our society are based around the model of the oikos or patriarchal household. And that emerging from this patriarchal household, the sort of patriarch who acts in public, who's the sort of prestiged or exalted public figure in society, is one who is obsessed with contracts and is one who's paranoid about contagion. 
Um, and I, I highly recommend Contract and Contagion to, to listeners. It's a fascinating book that came out from minor compositions, uh, so it was available free as a PDF online. And as soon as the pandemic started to roll out across the world, I thought immediately of this book because of its incredibly sophisticated engagement with the way in which a paranoia about contagion then both depends on and normalizes other forms of exploitation and violence. So in Pandemonium, Metropolis goes through a number of different approaches to this theme, thinking through how patriarchal forms and capitalism together are orchestrated in a moment that draws on a long history of racial capitalism and colonialism, but then also articulates sort of new frontiers for those systems as well. So there's a number of fascinating uh, parts within that book. There's an incredible section on the pandemic bonds that were offered by the World Bank. There's a very interesting section on the way that gut feelings of sort of patriarchal and authoritarian politicians became authoritative and led to the kind of marketing of new drugs, like the one I can never pronounce, hydrochlorazine, the one that basically Trump uh, and other politicians promoted. Uh, there's a long section on the history of quarantines and how ineffective they are at actually preventing the spread of disease, but how effective they are at reiterating structures of power and many other fascinating analyses within this short, condensed book. Well, Cassie, let's let's maybe move on to talk about The Hologram, because that's uh, coming out at the same time. So that's out in July. By the time you're listening to this, it should already be out. And it's based on a project that you began in 2016. I think that's right. Um, so I'd really just be interested to hear more about the genesis of the project, the story of the sort of Greek uh, clinics that you draw on in the book. Yeah. What, what was the story behind the hologram? How did it all begin? Yeah, I mean, it started because I kind of heard a rumor that during the financial crisis and the immigration crisis that was happening in Greece, that all of these free clinics had opened that were basically kind of offering health care to people who had been excluded from the healthcare system in Greece, which was a national health care system that is only for people through their jobs. So because lots of people had lost their jobs, a lot of people had lost access to health care. And what I heard was that there were not only free clinics, but there was a clinic that was experimenting with a specific model called the integrative model. So I heard about it in 2016 as a clinic where you could go and you would be seen by a medical doctor, a therapist, and a social worker, and that the social worker was a volunteer, like an untrained volunteer, or not untrained, but an, not a professional uh, caretaker. Mm-hmm. And that they would basically do an intake with a patient that took hours where they asked them about all aspects of their life, like where do they work and who is their family and to whom do they owe debt and are they lonely and that they would put together the responses to create a very multi- multi-dimensional health record for this person. And then because the group that was working on this, which is called the Group for a Different Medicine, who's coming working um, out of Thessaloniki, they really wanted to kind of upend the hierarchies of medicine. And so one way that they did that within this project is that they, um, they worked with the patient to make a plan that was really centered around what the patient needed and what they wanted to do with the support of these three practitioners. So whether it was like, you know, they are obviously going to need a surgery and, you know, maybe the doctor has a residency still at a hospital part time or knows people that work in a hospital and can get the person in. Or if the person is just incredibly lonely and really needs to have new ways to, you know, be with people or whatever it is, the group would work together with the the patient to kind of devise a plan that didn't involve money, where the person became active in their own health. And at the time that I was making, that I was learning about this, I was living in Oakland, California. Hmm. And I was just so struck by the amount of work that went into this project. And, you know, the fact that they were working in a squatted building that then had been handed over by the Greek government. Um, and the fact that like all of these professional caretakers were volunteering on this project made it seem like so amazing, but also completely impossible in the American context at the time. 
And yet we needed it so much because really nobody that I knew living in California had good access to health care. Health insurance was really expensive and privatized. You know, obviously, like our medical crisis has now been seen. But at the time before Trump, we weren't really spending that much time talking about uh, the crisis of medical care in the U.S. And meanwhile, we had so many big tech companies move into Silicon Valley and uh, basically take all the housing stock in Oakland and in San Francisco that there were so many people living on the street. But yet it was just so ironic that we weren't really talking about what was happening in Northern California or across the U.S. as a crisis, we were looking at what was happening in Greece as a crisis. And so I just, you know, I brought together a couple of different people in a, in a couple of different ways to kind of think about what it would take to translate what was happening at the Social Solidarity Clinic of Thessaloniki in the integrative model and translate it to something that we could do in the States where people really valued private health care. And also we, we just would never have access to a squatted building or to um, care workers who would be volunteers like that because nobody really could afford to do that. So um, a group came together and thought through what it would take to make this into a peer-to-peer -peer model. And so that became the hologram. And the idea is that we would have a model where the person who is receiving care is not seen as a patient. We call that person the hologram. Right. And that person is surrounded by three people, acquaintances or friends that they invite to, to come together. And those people act as caretakers, but not as uh, sort of professionals, not as advisors, but as people who ask really good questions and pay attention over time. So the model works like, you know, the person who's called the hologram has a triangle and those people might meet like every season. And over time, the triangle really gets to know all sorts of bits and pieces about what makes the hologram healthy. We still use the model of um, one person pays attention to physical characteristics, one person asks questions about the social experience, and one person asks questions about the mental and emotional experience of the hologram. And the idea is that over time, the people in the triangle become like a living medical record for the hologram. And the project uh, necessarily to kind of ruin hierarchy and to say that we don't really we can't really receive care from people who are not cared for the project has to be viral so all of the people who are giving care also at a certain point need to become holograms themselves and have three people looking after them and so you know reciprocation looks a little bit different in this project it's not that everybody is giving and taking um, like back and forth between you know the way that capitalism has us kind of working through the transaction, this project is quite different in that you you give care to somebody and you receive care from somebody else, but it's not going back and forth. Um, so yeah, I mean, and the, the wish for the project is that it becomes a decentralized project that kind of becomes a regular part of lots of people's practices and that it exists kind of underneath the medical care that they already receive, but maybe supports them to get care better. And over time, you know, I, I hope that it becomes something that, that people do um, and with a kind of long term commitment so that, you know, maybe um, like if you had a hologram, Chris, and you had three people mm -hmm. working with you, you might start and say, like, let's do this for a year and see how it works. And then at the end of the year, you're going to have a conversation about what to do next. And what if you had three people with you like that for 10 years or 15 years? And you actually had a kind of like rhythm of routine and also like a kind of set of like cultures and practices between you that made you feel like super solid and strong as things change in the world. And as we know that like we're going to have so many we're going to have so many more experiences of crisis like what we're experiencing now. But the idea that we could actually plan something relational that would give us strength to kind of proceed through the coming crises, but also give us the ability to actually plan into the future rather than to just have to kind of constantly react. That's the real, the real wish is sort of like building like long-term relationships and plans that can outlast and outlive capitalism. That was Max Haven and Cassie Thornton talking about the new Vagabond series. If you want to keep listening, the unabridged version of this and all other episodes of Radicals in Conversation are available exclusively to our Patreon members. Head over to patreon.com forward slash Pluto Press to join today from just £3 per month. 
And you can head over to plutobooks.com forward slash podcast reading for 50% off the books that have featured in today's conversation. Just enter the coupon code podcast at the checkout. We'll be back next month with another episode of Radicals in Conversation. So thanks again for listening and we'll see you soon. Thank you.